Okay, so this is the sixth oncology prologue. First question, a 53-year-old woman has no history. She has a 10-centimeter ovarian mass. You find gelatinous material on the surface of the ovary, and you suspect pseudomyxoma peritonei. You find mucinous material in the cul-de-sac and omentum, and the frozen section is atypical proliferating mucinous tumor. Where is it coming from? Colon, rectum, stomach, appendix, ovary. Okay. So remember that whenever you see a mucinous ovarian tumor, you always remove the appendix. Okay. And there's different categories here of the um, definitions. There's adenomucinosis, mucinous carcinomatosis, and, of course, there's intermediate. But what you want to focus on is these two. So adenomucinosis is benign. It's not malignant, but it can still be fatal. And that's the typical one that you see. It's, most of these are not cancerous. They're just benign or borderline tumors. And then carcinomatosis is when the tumor is actually malignant. And what you do is you try and evacuate all the mucin and strip the peritoneum. And I think I might have mentioned this before. They used to use ether, but the patients would blow up every once in a while, so they stopped. Okay, and the survival rate is not all that great. It's a matter of years because these come back over and over again and patients finally die from bowel obstruction. Now this is actually going to touchy-feely stuff. Somebody has vulvar cancer. What's the most likely sexual problem they're going to have? Hypoactive sexual disorder, anorgasmia, dyspareunia, or vaginismus? Okay, the answer is going to be A. GYN cancer patients have a big problem with altered sexual identity after surgery, even bigger than breast cancer patients and, and big GI cancer patients. Okay, so they have decreased sexual desire. And remember we talked about what is the, if you see a question on this, when you look at the question, what's the most important thing in the history? Does the patient still what? Fantasize, okay? So if a patient says that they don't have any desire for their partner, but they're still having fantasies on the boards, that would be a relationship issue, counseling, blah, blah, blah. If someone didn't have fantasies anymore, then you would need to do a complete workup, and that's going to include free testosterone and, and everything else. If someone has orgasm, orgasmic disorder, remember you can have primary or secondary. Primary means you've never had one. Secondary means they stopped. And how do you treat primary anorgasmia. I wouldn't urge you to do it yourself with the patient. Directed masturbation. And then how do you treat secondary anorgasmia? And we're trying to eliminate whatever's causing it. Well, you're supposed to do um, sensate focused exercises, which means foreplay. So you teach the patient and her partner foreplay so they stop worrying about the orgasm. And then dyspareunia, remember, can be introidal which can be like vestibular syndrome, we're going to talk about that, or herpes or infection or stricture, or it can be deep dyspareunia, which on the boards is going to be endometriosis, endometriosis, endometriosis. And then you can have vaginal dyspareunia, which is usually vaginitis. And then what's vaginismus? So, it's, yeah, it's involuntary spasm of the pelvic floor, either with intercourse or with a digital exam. And those patients are most often going to be sexual trauma patients, and they do they need no surgery. Surgery is always going to be <clears throat> the wrong answer. So if you see you know relaxing incision or something like that, it's going to be a trick. So those folks need counseling, biofeedback, vaginal dilators, but no surgery. So this patient is most likely to have hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Okay, a 39-year-old has a cone at 23 weeks of pregnancy. She has 7 millimeters of invasion and negative margins, and she wants to keep the pregnancy. What's your stage? Why is it that, and what do you do? So, 7 millimeters is how deep can a 1B 1B. Deep 
Okay. And how about 1B2? Okay. So this is something, there's something kind of fishy here. All right. So you've got... One B one. Okay, I'm sorry. One B is greater than seven millimeters, and this is going to be treated with what? Okay. What if it was one A two? How would you treat it? So if it's one A two, you're going still going to do a rad hist. What if it's one A one? You've done a cone. Yeah, frankly, two, that would be enough. Like, you stop. Yep. So yeah. for 1A1, the, remember you have to do a, a cone to diagnose these, right? So for 1A1, you're done. For 1A2, which is between 3 and 5 millimeters deep, okay, you're supposed to do a rad hist. For 1B1, you're supposed to do a rad hist, okay? Now, do you need, this patient's 23 weeks. It's still legal to do a termination. Do you recommend a termination? Well, okay, she desires it, but what do you recommend? No. Nope. There's no reason to recommend a termination. There's no, there's no data saying that terminating the pregnancy helps. This cutoff of doing, in fact, I think it's in here. This cutoff here of doing 24 weeks, greater than 24 weeks, that's not based on survival. That's based on the law. So what they recommend is that you offer termination below 24 weeks because that's the maximum age of termination in the U.S., okay? And also, this, is, this stuff is just not going to happen. Um, if somebody has like a stage 2 or 3 cervical cancer, they recommend that you start radiation therapy and kill the fetus. Do you think there's any radiation therapist or radiation tech that's going to agree to that? No, okay? So this is something that's, you know, kind of idealized. But this patient here, she can wait until she is 32 weeks or whatever MFM says. You're going to give her steroids, and then you're going to do a classical C-section so you don't get in, into the parametrium, deliver the baby, and then you're going to do a radical C-hist and a lymph node dissection. And the survival is as good as not being pregnant. So C, cesarean section, followed by rad hist. Okay, let's skip this. And you can't do this too many times because you guys are always going to, this is a difficult one to, to handle like right on the boards. Somebody has AGC not otherwise specified. What do you do? She's 35. Okay, so... Remember that AGC, oh, well, they don't have anything here. Okay, so hold on a sec. So if somebody has AGC favor endometrium, what do you do? Endometrial biopsy, okay. And then the other two categories are AGC NOS or AGC favor neoplasia or adenocarcinoma in situ. And those folks get treated the same. They get HPV, colposcopy, ECC, and if they are over 35 or they have risk factors, they also get an endometrial biopsy, okay? Now, what happens next is there's a huge difference between NOS and these guys. These guys are headed for a cone, all right? So if you don't find any invasive cancer on your colposcopy, they're going to get either a cold knife cone or a leap, okay? These folks, if you don't find anything, you're going to watch them. And the way you watch them depends on the HPV status. If you're HPV negative and you know it, then you can wait a year. If you're HPV positive, you only wait six months. If you don't know the HPV status, you start at six months. And you're supposed to do either two negatives or four pap smears if you don't know the HPV status. That's not really important. Okay? And then if you change your diagnosis based on your colposcopy, 
let's say it comes out CIN1, 2, or 3, you treat them as CIN1, 2, or 3. Okay. The glandular cells that we are talking about are endocervical gland cells? Well, you don't know. If it says NOS, that means they can't tell, right? Yeah. So you could have endometrial cancer or endocervical cancer? Yep. Or nothing. Okay, this is a this is one a uh, narcotic question. It's kind of it's written kind of strangely. Here's somebody who is terminal. She's on 45 milligrams of morphine every two hours and Motrin. She has nausea and constipation. What are you going to do for her? First off, if you saw this on the boards, what's wrong with this? Yeah, you're taking a sh this medication is wearing off every two hours. So what would you change her to? A single, yep. So she's taking, it says every two hours, so let's say she's taking 400 milligrams of morphine a day. So you would change that to about 80-90% MS cotton if they asked you, and then keep two doses of breakthrough morphine. But the first thing you should do is, this is, horrible, this is terrible because she's constantly staring at the clock and it's constantly wearing off. And she has severe constipation, okay? So which of these are appropriate for constipation? Polyethylene glycol? Zofran? Is this appropriate for constipation? Yeah. yeah. How about Zofran? No. no. Decrease your Motrin? No, that's gonna cause that's gonna cause her gastritis, right? But not constipation. Do you increase some morphine? No, she's in pain. Lactulose. Okay. All right, an eighty year old with a history of breast cancer. Right away, how did breast cancer and vulvar complaints tie in? What condition could give you breast problems and vulvar problems? Pagets. All right. Vulvar burning and pruritus. She has a velvety red eczematoid appearance. Okay. So you know what that's going to be. And here it is here. And that's reddish, bilat you know, bilateral, scaly, and that's going to be Paget's, okay? You perform wide local excision with clear margins, but the microscopic result has a positive margin. What are you going to do? You're going to leave a positive margin on someone with Paget's? No, it doesn't. It's going to come back anyway, even with a negative margin, okay? So it's, it's famous for coming back. And what are you worried about when you excise the pagets? You're looking for cancer under the pagets, right? How often do you see it under the nipple if you have pagets in the nipple? It's almost 100%. How often do you see it under the vulva? 15%, okay? So if you see a Paget's patient on your boards, or especially on your oral boards, you want to work that patient up for cancer. So you would do a, a GI workup, colposcopy, you would have them seen by you know, internal medicine. Make sure you're not missing a pelvic cancer. So she needs expectant management. Good. Okay. You're counseled about an 82-year-old woman who has shortness of breath, early satiety, and bloating. She has medical problems. She has a 15 centimeter adnexal mass, adenopathy, caking, and liver mets. Her CA125 is 13,000. She has thoracentesis, which shows malignant cytology. What's the most appropriate initial treatment for this patient? Why? So, is A a good choice? No, because you're left with liver mets and pleural mets, okay? Is B a possible choice? Yeah. C? No. You don't do intraperitoneal chemo in someone who has gross disease. Yep. Well, she has a mental cake, right? So you can't do, all right, palliative care. Okay, so it's going to be A, A, 
or I'm sorry, B or D. So what do they pick? IV chemo. Okay, why do they pick that? Not because they just want to operate in everybody or treat everybody, but because you may be able to actually get her a remission. Even though you're, there's no real possibility of a cure, she may get months and months of remission, which is really palliating her. All right, Palliative care is going to go sour very quickly because she's going to keep on reaccumulating that fluid. And treating her may get rid of that, that problem. Okay. A 60-year-old comes to your office with pelvic discomfort, abdominal girth. She has no history. She has a fixed pelvic mass, nodularity, and ascites. What do you do next? CA-125, proteomic studies, endometrial biopsy, cytology of the ascites, or send her away to an oncologist? So somebody wants to do cytology on the ascites and someone wants to call an oncologist. Why? Well, number one, an oncologist is going to be writing this question, right? Let's I mean, be realistic. Now, you know, MFM is not going to be writing this question. And there is retrospective evidence to show that if you, the first person who sees a patient is an oncologist and does the first surgery, the outcome's better. Okay. Now, in real life, when you see this patient in your office, you're going to order a CA-125, order a CAT scan, and call your oncologist. Mm -hmm. But you're only allowed to pick one choice here. So the best choice is going to be to call G1 Oncology. And you don't do the ascites because it can go in the trap. Right? You could, if you know somebody can have malignancy and you tap their ascites, they can have... Well, Someone like this, there's, it's not really an issue. I mean, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But if you have somebody who you want to make a diagnosis on, you should not drain it because, yeah, you can convert it into stage four. And why not um, see one thing? Because you can only do one thing, okay? I mean, you will do it, but just the, the initial thing. Of the, thing. Oh, okay. the most important thing is to refer. Mm -hmm. And again, who do you think wrote this question? Okay, 48-year-old has stage four endometriosis. She has a uh, schedule for hysterectomy, BSO, and colon resection. The surgeon has ordered bowel prep, pre-op antibiotics, perioperative SCDs, early operative feed, post-operative feeding. Which one is not indicated? Bowel preparation, why? It's been found to do worse than no bowel prep. Probably because of all the liquid we give patients, they have high pressure in their colon, and then when you cut the colon, it all comes spilling out, even though it's got a lower bacterial count. So now there is not an indication for a mechanical bowel prep. We used to send patients home if they hadn't had a bowel prep, and now it turns out it doesn't make any difference. A 47-year-old comes to your office as a new patient. She has no family history. She had a breast biopsy showing fibrocystic change with no atypia and no proliferation. Everything's normal. Compared with the general population, her risk of getting breast cancer is lower, the same, slightly up, markedly up. Okay, and if you look down here, I think, nope, not this one. The things that, it, what, in, what things on the breast biopsy increase your chance of getting breast cancer? No. Proliferation, atypia, ductal carcinoma in situ. Okay. Fibroadenomas, if they turn into something, what do they turn into? They turn into, uh, oh, now I'm blanking out in the name. Not botryoides. It's the very, very low-grade big tumor, the big ones but they don't become a regular ductal carcinoma, okay? So proliferation, atypia, dysplasia, ductal carcinoma in situ, those are the ones that have increased, increased risk, okay? Okay, here we go. Women's Health Initiative. A 60-year-old woman has no prior surgery. She began using PremPro 11 years ago. She has continued with this treatment. What does she have an increased risk of cancer of? Endometrium, breast, 
colon cervix. Prempro. Yep. What if she had been taking Premarin and she'd had a hysterectomy 20 years ago for fibroids? Yep. And actually, the most recent stuff that comes out has shown that Premarin, go figure, has a slightly lower risk of breast cancer compared to nothing. Prempro has a higher risk. Okay. And what's the most what's the most important thing about giving Prempro to a patient if you do it? You want to do it while they're young, and you want to give the lowest dose possible, and you don't plan on keeping them on it forever. And all this stuff was based on the Women's Health Initiative. And what was the average age of those patients? Mid 60s. Okay, I don't use that word around me, okay? So, do you start someone who's 65 on Prempro? No. no, you start them when they're 51, all right? So, this is all the problem with this is in research, when you give an old animal Prempro, they get heart disease and cancer. When you give a young animal Prempro, they get protect protection against heart disease. So it's all kind of up in the air. Now what, what will the Premarin patient get? What is she at risk for? Stroke. Stroke, DVT, dementia. The Prempro patient is at risk of stroke, heart attack, breast cancer, DVT, and dementia. And they also, both of them, are at risk for worsening of their urinary incontinence if they have it. We'll come back to that, unfortunately. Protective is against osteoporosis and colon. Prempro is protective against colon cancer. Premarin is not. They both are protective against osteoporosis. Okay, we'll skip this one. Okay, 42-year-old comes to the ER with dyspnea and a cough. She's been bleeding since a baby five months ago. She has multiple lung meds. So what does she have? GTD. Okay. Not GTD? What's the difference? GTD is a mole. GTD is a mole, okay? And it's a benign mole that goes away. GTN is either a recurrent mole or, P, or PSTT or choriocarcinoma. And her quant is 34,000. She has lung mets, so she has metastatic GTN, and it's high risk, and it's most likely choriocarcinoma. It is not placental site trophoblastic disease. Now, they are probably going to jerk us around here, but it's not called choriocarcinoma because you don't have a tissue sample, but it almost certainly is choriocarcinoma. How would you know if it was a PT, PSTT, choice C? Her quant would be zero, low or zero, and what would be elevated? HPL, okay? But her quant's 34,000, 33,000, so we know it's not going to be PSTT. And let's look for a second at the staging for this. If I have it here, here we go. So the FIGO staging, stage one, two, three, four, this is confusing. One is the uterus, two is the pelvis, three is the lungs, and four is the abdomen and liver. Okay, so it flips around from what you're used to. All right. Here is the Harvard system. It is impossible to remember. And when I take when I get recertified in oncology, I memorize this the night before, take the boards, and then I forget it on the way home. Okay. So it's age, what kind of pregnancy, how many months. What's your HCG? Less than 1,000, less than 10,000, less than 100,000, more than 100,000. Biggest tumor size, number of METs, and type of chemotherapy. And low risk is less than 5 points, high risk is more than 7 points, and medium risk is 5 to 7 points. Low risk is single agent, high risk is EMICO, and 
medium risk is where things are, are kind of confusing compared to the old system, okay? What's Emico? Etoposide, methotrexate, actinomycin, cytoxin, and oncovin, which is vincristine. So starting with you, etoposide causes secondary cancer. Methotrexate causes mucositis and hepatitis. Actinomycin, doctor, causes... Remember, actinomycin is famous for causing radiation recall. It causes baldness, it causes bone marrow suppression, but it's the one where if you've had radiation for something and you get actinomycin, all your radiation symptoms come back, okay? Cytoxin is caught famous for causing okay, hemorrhagic cystitis, and vincristine, I know you're trying to avoid my gaze, but vincristine causes... No, it causes neuropathy, and it causes a, a weird form of neuropathy. It causes um, autonomic neuropathy, and you get, like, bowel obstruction, okay? Remember, vinblastine causes bone marrow suppression. Vinblastine blasts the bone marrow. Then Christine causes neurotoxicity, okay? Okay, this, this is... Do not worry about the exact answer to this question. I just want to go over the risk factors they talk about. The non-genetic factor that puts you at high, highest risk for getting breast cancer and may require increased surveillance or risk reduction measures is first live birth after 30 years, smoking two packs, having a 60-pack year history, lymphoma with chest radiation, leukemia with an alkylating agent, using combination hormone therapy for five years. And before we look at the answers, just look at these each and tell me whether that makes things worse or better. First live birth after 30 years. Makes it worse. Worse. Tobacco. Not really. Remember, smoking is a carcinogen, but what else does smoking do to your estrogen? Remember, smokers have early menopause, infertility, osteoporosis, they lose estrogen, okay? Lymphoma treated with chest radiation. Chest radiation is a biggie for later breast cancer. So this is bad, this is bad. Leukemia with an alkylating agent. What kind of cancer do you get from alkylating agents? Leukemia. You can get a, second, you can get a secondary leukemia. And use of Prempro for five years. Yes. Now, if it was just Premarin, you'd say no. Okay, now let's look at their answers. The most important one is chest radiation, okay? And here is, you know, that you can't even really combine these. You can't compare these because there are different numbers here. But having a personal history of breast cancer is fivefold. Being nulliparous all your life, threefold. Late birth is even worse than being nulliparous, okay? No, no one knows why. Early menarch, not really. I'm sorry, guys. Late menopause, 1.5. Chest radiation is probably at least a four to five fold increase, okay? 30% lifetime risk. And Prempro, they can't even really call it, okay? It's very, very low. It's like 1.2 compared to the rest of these. Now, alcohol and obesity are increased factors. The way to remember it is estrogen. Alcohol damages your liver. You can't metabolize estrogen. Obesity stores estrogen. Yeah, those may make sense. The answer here is breast ra chest radiation. Okay. In a woman with no prior history of DES exposure, the most likely underlying condition associated with vaginal clear cell adenocarcinoma is... Radiation, endometriosis, pagets, BRCA, non-polyposis non colorectal cancer. It's kind of a tricky question. So what's the most common kind of vaginal cancer? It's a trick. Metastatic. 
whenever you see a patient on the boards that has cancer in the vagina, look at the question very carefully and see if you can blame it on somebody else. And the rule is, if you can blame it on somebody else, you do. Okay. Now, if they have a history of cervical cancer, squamous, and they have adenocarcinoma in the vagina, you can't do that. But if you can match them up, then blame it on the primary. Aside from METS, what's the most common primary? Squamous, right? Okay. And second most common is what? Adenocarcinoma, which has always historically been clear cell from what? DES. Remember, DES is not a carcinogen, it's a teratogen. So it crosses your placenta, your placenta can't handle it, and it causes adenosis in the vagina, glands in the vagina. And about one out of 100,000 times they become malignant. So what kind of condition turns into clear cell cancer in the ovary? Endometriosis. That's the answer, pelvic endometriosis. Okay, prior pelvic irradiation, we talked about a couple weeks ago. What kind of cancer does that give you? Sarcoma. Remember the risk factors for sarcomas are radiation, toxin exposure, neurofibromatosis, and familial retinoblastoma. Okay. Pagis disease of the vulva would give you underlying vulvar cancer. Okay. BRCA would give you typically breast or ovarian cancer. And non-polyposis colon cancer would give you what? Endometrial. Colon cancer and endometrial cancer. Okay. All right. What's the answer? Pelvic endometriosis. 55-year-old woman comes in for her first GYN exam. She's getting hot flashes. She has fullness in the left supraclavicular and cervical lymph nodes. Her abdomen is normal, but she has a cervical cancer. What's the next procedure you do? Endometrial biopsy, DNC, cystoprocto, supraclavicular lymph node. Lymph yeah, lymph node biopsy, supraclavicular lymph node. Remember, number one, you're allowed to do it because she has a physical finding, so it's, it's part of the staging. And number two, it makes the biggest difference, okay? That makes her what stage? For stage four. B, right? 4A is bladder and rectum, 4B is distant, and it changes everything. And she actually has about a 15% chance of having a positive lymph node or more. Okay. A 47-year-old has pneumonia. Somebody got a CA-125 and it was 90. There's no other findings. What do you do? Repeat it. It's elevated. There are benign things where it can be elevated. Like what? Pneumonia. Any cause of peritonitis. Okay, so pneumonia will cause peritonitis. Peritonitis will elevate your CA-125. If you are premenopausal, what level of CA-125 is supposed to trigger a immediate workup? Over 200. Okay. Now, in reality, you will order a pelvic ultrasound. I mean, that no one, I mean in, in real life, okay? And you will follow it. But on this here, you're just, the only, the best thing to do here is to watch. Oh, skip this. Skip this. Ah, 22. A 42 year old woman undergoes laparoscopic supracervical hist for abnormal uterine bleeding. She's got squamous cell cancer. She has a 2.5 centimeter cervical stump with a visible tumor. Okay. Now, right away, what stage is that? Just from that sentence, what stage is it? Minimum. Why? Because it's visible. Yep. So visible must be at least, you can't have a visible 1A. All right. The vagina has no lesions. There is no parametrial extension. Do you want to take the cervix out and radiate, take the cervix out and do lymph nodes, do a radical trachelectomy and radiate, do a radical trachelectomy and lymph nodes? Sorry. 
Huh? She's 1B1. We think. Yeah. Yep. So she can have radical recognition and element mode. Okay. What about choice C? You want to make sure you're not missing something? Yeah, C is combining two separate treatments. If you want to, you can just do pelvic radiation, okay, with a vaginal boost. But C is going to be the most morbid. You're combining two separate treatments in one. D, the odds are probably 85% that that's the only thing you're going to need to do. Yeah. In a radical trachelectomy, these are embarrassing surgeries. They take forever. They take like six, eight hours sometimes. And the, the problem is the bladder, the vaginal cuff, and the rectum are all sewed together, so you have to dissect them up. And then you take the parametrial tissue, and everyone's, you know, watching you sweat and moan and complain. And then you take out this little piece of junk, and you send it to pathology, and everyone goes, is that what it took you all day to get out? And they're, they're not easy because you wind up injuring the rectum and injuring the bladder. And then if you've got to do radiation afterwards, then you're, you're in trouble. But simple is just cervical. Simple is just like doing a cone. All right. Now, the cure rate for this patient is going to be the same as somebody who never had a hist in the first place. Her complication rate is going to be higher. If she needs radiation, her complication rate is going to be very high. Hmm? There is a specific definition of rad hist, right? You take it at the anterior division of... So what are the five types of hysterectomies? What's a type one? Simple. Simple what? Extra. Extra fascial. Okay. What's an extra fascial hysterectomy? The one where we dissect the bladder away and we... We leave the endopelvic fascia on the specimen. Okay, intrafascial hysterectomy is where someone's had radiation or it's like a TOA or something and you don't know where you are. So you actually dig into the cervix and they bleed a lot. You lose a lot more blood, by the way. And you leave the endopelvic fascia in the patient. Okay, those are both type 1. And what's a type 2 and 3? There is a modified radical. What's a type 2? Yep. There is a radical Yep. And a radical hysterectomy, you take the cardinal and uterosacral ligaments halfway to two-thirds out, okay? And you remove the ureter from the tunnel, which is a big deal. So when you are spending all your time dissecting out the ureter and that's when you get a lot of bleeding, that's a type 3, okay? And a type 4 and 5 are on the way to exoneration. For the boards, what I would worry about are types 1, 2, and 3. Two is you take half the ligaments and you leave the ureter in the tunnel and just kind of push it, push it away, okay? And three is take the ureter out of the tunnel and take probably two-thirds of the ligaments and more of the upper vagina. Okay, 41-year-old, has had a tubal, has irregular bleeding, enlarged uterus, Intermediate trophoblasts. Now, without looking further, what does she have? PSTT. PSTT. That comes from an intermediate trophoblast. Her HCG is 100. Her HPL is probably much higher. They don't say anything about it. There's no METs. What do you do for this patient? A hysterectomy. How about she was 21 para zero? What are you going to do for her? hysterectomy, okay? These are treated with hysterectomy. And as far as I know, there are no cures for metastatic disease like we have all the time with choriocarcinoma. So the answer is hysterectomy. This is a, this is a likely one to see. A 58-year-old has stage 1 breast cancer. She's been on tamoxifen for four years, okay? Why do they do that? 
So it's adjuvant therapy, and there's about a 10% increase in survival. And what did they test her specimen for before they gave her tamoxifen? And progesterone receptors. So she's receptor positive. What would you have given her if she was receptor negative? Lotrazole. Chemotherapy. No, you don't give lotrazole to someone who's receptor negative. There's no point. Okay. So she has vaginal bleeding and she has a six millimeter stripe. So what are you going to do? You want to do an endometrial biopsy. Why? What if she had a six millimeter? What if she had a six millimeter stripe and no bleeding? What would you do? You, won't do anything. you don't do anything. Okay. So the reason you're doing the biopsy is because she's bleeding. Okay. What are you going to find on that biopsy? Are you going to find cancer? Hyperplasia? This is weird. Even though they have a thick stripe, it's what they call this spongy hyperplasia. It's not real hyperplasia. And what they wind up having is atrophic endometrium. Okay. Because they're taking it. Well, what's the most common thing to find in a 58 year old? Yeah, it's atrophy. Yeah, it's normal. Yep. Uh, skip that. Skip this. Okay, a 46 year old undergoes a TAHBSO for big fibroids. She has endometriosis. The right ovary is densely adherent to the right pelvic sidewall. The posterior cul de sac is obliterated. What do you do before you do anything else? Find the ureter, okay? And remember that the ureter is going to be on the medial leaf of the broad ligament, and it's going to be posterior to the ovarian ligament, and that's always the first thing to do. And what are you going to do if in, when you're cutting that patient's infundibular pelvic ligament, you see a big spurt of urine, and you realize that not only have you cut the infundibular pelvic, you've cut that ureter. What do you do? Not in the boards. What do you do? You re them at the same time. Why not reimplant it? Because it's alone. It's more than four centimeters yeah. from the bladder. Okay. So more than four centimeters, which is, I mean, definitely at a pelvic brim, you're more than four centimeters. You're supposed to re most. If you cut the ureter while you're dissecting the cervix out, then you're supposed to reimplant the ureter. What's that called? When you reimplant the ureter, ureter neocystotomy. Okay, what do you call it when you reanastomose the ureter? Yep, ureter ureter reanastomosis. Okay, which one is better? Yep, I have seen patients after I've done the reanastomosis. I've seen IVPs, and you want to cry. I mean, they've got these. Right above the anastomosis is this big dilated ureter because the nerves are cut and it never becomes normal again. So this one here, you're going to identify the ureter, okay? What are you going to do on the boards if while you are dissecting out, you see a spurt of liquid and you don't know if it's a lymphocyst or urine or what? Into the bladder? IV. So IV indigocarmine if you think you've cut the ureter. What if you're dissecting the bladder off the cervix and you cut a hole in the bladder and you've just started your hysterectomy? Huh? You can kill the your hysterectomy. Okay, so you don't fix it. Okay? It's your friend now. In fact, what I used to do in those cases, I would just cut the bladder open. If things were stuck, I'd just cut the bladder open, stick my finger in, to suck the bladder off and then close the bladder. It's better to say you did it on purpose than you admit that you had to cut a hole in the, you know, you cut it by accident. Okay, so fi finish the surgery and then fix the bladder. 
What do you do if a vag hissed? And as you're trying to get up in the anterior space, you see a gush of urine. Well, one choice is to give up, do it abdominally. One choice is to do the same thing, use that hole as an aid. But what are you worried about? When you're looking at someone's bladder from below, what part of the bladder are you looking at? Trigon. Trigon, okay. When you're dissecting someone's bladder off the cervix, what are you dissecting? The, the roof. The base, okay. So remember, there's a dome, a base, and a trigone. What gets you afraid? Trigone. trigone. So when you injure a bladder through a vag hist incision, you are in a lot more danger than you are abdominally. That's okay. because it doesn't heal well? No, because you might have, you, when you no, fix you it, you can you obstruct the ureters. Okay. So that patient, when you, whatever you do, you need to, at the end, you need to do cystoscopy or you need to evaluate the ureter orifices. Okay, let's take a break. And I'll pause. So you guys know more about this than I do because I've never seen one of these. But here's a 25-year-old with no kids who has a stage 1B1. It's 3.5 centimeters. And there's no sign of spread. What can you offer her? What are your choices? It's adenocarcinoma. Do you want to offer her radiation therapy? One week one and one two A, you can still do both things. Huh? One B, one B and two A, you can still do both the things. What things? Rad hist versus radiation. Okay. They can have both. And if someone's 25 years old, what's the consequences of radiation? Uh, what's your life expectancy when you're 25? It's about 65, 60, 65 years. What's going to happen to your vagina in that time? It's going to stenose. Okay, so a young patient, you want to try and avoid radiation therapy. Is radiation the treatment of choice for adenocarcinoma? No. Okay. So you want to do surgery. What kind of surgery can you do? You can do a rad hist and nodes. What's going to happen if that happens? Sterilized. Okay, so what else can you do? You can do a radical trachelectomy. Come on, this, you guys do these here, right? You don't, have you seen one? Okay, so you do a laparotomy, right? And you amputate the fundus. Then you do a radical trachelectomy from below or above? Well, it was from above, right? Yeah. So you do a radical trachelectomy like you would do if somebody had already had a hist. You amputate the uterus and leave it in place, and then you suture the vagina to the uterine fundus, okay? And you do frozen section, if you can, on the cervix to make sure you got a negative margin, okay? And that really is considered to be as effective as a rad hist, okay? There are kids. The kids have been born. I mean, it's it sounds it sounds hopeless, but kids have been born with this. Do you do the circlage at that time? You do a circlage. Uh -huh. Did Dr. Morris you put in a stent and a circlage? Stent. Yeah. Circlage. Yeah. Stent where? Like in the. Um, Canal. Canal. Yeah. Yeah. That's I Mac and I used to do that for cervical stenosis. We would put those stents in. Yeah. Okay. So she can have a radical trachelectomy, or a radical hysterectomy. And because of her nulliparity and she wants kids, you should offer her a radical trachelectomy. You're not going to do a comb biopsy on a 1B1. Radiation therapy is going to cause sterility and vaginal stenosis, and a simple hysterectomy is not done for cervical cancer. Good. A 23-year-old nulliparous patient has no family history of breast or ovarian cancer, comes to see you about contraception. She wants to reduce her risk of developing ovarian cancer, okay? So if this was a CREOGS, it would say, which of the following will reduce your chance of ovarian cancer? And the answers are birth control pills, progestin-only pills, Marina, 
or Depo-Provera? What's the answer? Combination birth control pills. Because they prevent what? Ovulation. Okay. Progestin-only pills are the worst at preventing ovulation. Depo is very poor at preventing ovulation. And the marina is not even designed to suppress it. Okay. 47-year-old is having surgery for squamous cell cancer of the vulva. She has a sentinel lymph node biopsy of her inguinal feminal nodes with blue dye and radiation colloid. She has a blue radioactive hot node in her vulva and her groin. What is this? And what should you do? This means she has mets, right? Really? So you're operating on someone's vulvar cancer, you inject it with dye and radioactive isotope, very small amount, and you find this radioactive colored lymph node in her groin. What's that tell you? It tells that the area is draining into the groin. So well, you knew that. You've been, you've been to medical school. That's your sentinel lymph node, guys, yeah. right? So okay, so what do you do? No, 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 no. You're, all this means is that's her sentinel lymph node. Okay, you take that out. You do a frozen on it. That's the first, the first train spot. You know, the first way station on the way to everything else. So if that lymph node is negative, what do you do? Stop. If that lymph node's positive, what do you do? A complete dissection on that side. Okay, so this blue node should be removed, and I think they might have a picture. And it's the same for the breast Yeah. Yeah. So there it is, okay? So this is a vulvar cancer. They're injecting it with dye. And they find this blue node and take it out. And I mean, this, you know, this is a 10 minute procedure compared to like an hour for a ad lymphadenectomy. And remember, when you do a complete lymphadenectomy, your patient's going to get infection, wound breakdown, lymphedema. It's not, not harmless. So. Okay. A 30 year old comes to your office. Her mom had uterine cancer, and three maternal relatives, and that's the requirement three relatives with early colon cancer. She has Lynch 1. What else did you do? CEA, colonoscopy, cystoscopy, CAT scan, nothing. She's 30 years old. You want to start that at 30? Or 10 years from the last. What she has lent. So the answer is colonoscopy and upper GI. Okay. Starting at age 20 to 25 or 10 years before the earliest occurrence, whichever is worst, every couple years. CEA is not recommended. Okay. Oops. What's that? Okay, yeah. If I can recognize it, it can only be one thing, right? Cancer. Okay, so that's a mole, all right? Otherwise, I wouldn't know what I'm looking at. So what is... The most significant risk factor for postmolar GTN. Remember, we said the GTD was a mole, and GTN is usually when the mole recurs. And here's the information: she's got a 10-week size uterus, and she's 10 weeks out. Is that a risk factor? No. Size greater than dates is a risk factor, right? Her quant is 135,000. Really? It's one of those gradients. Okay. She has an adnexal mass and a complete mole. So is it her age, bleeding, uterine size, HCG, or ovarian cyst? Her HCG is greater than... I think it's 100,000 is the cutoff. Yep. 
and mo usually everybody, all comers, have a 15% chance of having the mole recur. If you have these, if you have Thecaludian cysts, size greater than dates, um, quant greater than 1,000, those are the things that give you increased risk factors, and it goes from like 20% to like 60%. And this patient has about a 40% chance of it coming back. What do you want to, if you knew that, knowing that, what are you going to do? Want to go ahead and give her chemo right after the evacuation? Why no. We watch her because still she has a less than 50% chance of having this come back, right? So what you do is you warn her you must come back. You must not disappear. And at the first sign of increasing quant, then you start treating her. What do you want to give her? She would be still be low risk. So what are your choices for chemo? Methotrexate, actinomycin D, oral VP16, okay, single agent regimens. Now, if you're going to give her methotrexate, how do you want to give it? What's the easiest way to handle? If you give her methotrexate five days in a row, she will get sick. I've seen this happen all the time. If you give her alternating methotrexate and folinic acid, they usually tolerate it very, very well. Okay. 40-year-old with a history of metastatic choreo is about to have brain surgery. Her significant other is presently at work. She has three kids. Her best friend is here. She has told her friend what she wants done on numerous occasions. The best choice to ensure that all her health care wishes are carried out is to... Okay, so what's in a living will? Everything she wants, she can tell whether she wants to be resuscitated, whether she wants feeding later on, she can give all the directions. Any of the choices on there? What's a durable health care, durable care power of attorney? In case they become incapacitated, that person will take the decision. Okay, which one do you think they would approve, they prefer on the boards? The husband. Yeah, yeah a durable health care power of attorney. That means if you're incapacitated and you've appointed me, I can make decisions. If, I ha if you just have a living will that says no code and something happens that's preventable or treatable, you're out of luck. They're not going to code you, okay? Mm -hmm. The only bad part is that a durable health care power of attorney expires when you die. So you still need to have a will to spell out what you want to have done after you die. Let's we'll see what they say. Yep, durable health care power of attorney. I just went through this with my mom when she died, and it's actually very complicated because everything was my dad, but my dad was already dead, and then there's two children, and you got to specify which child you want to make the decisions, and it gets kind of, it gets kind of dicey. Say that you don't want to be resuscitated, even if it's a small thing, they will not resuscitate you. That's what you're saying. On the boards, yeah. But now, usually living wills will say, if it's something that can't be fixed, then I don't want to be coded. But it's up to you. Yeah, but then there are some questions whose answer is the living will. Mm -hmm. Well, if, they're, if you're comparing a living will to a durable power of attorney, take the power of attorney, if there's choices. What do you do with a 21-year-old with ascus and she's gotten Gardasil? You treat them as regular patients, or you do HPV. Do HPV. If the HPV is positive, what do you do? You do blood And if the copo is negative, what do you do? You put them back. If they have HPV positive and copo negative, then you do six months and then or? Or one HPV. Yep. One. So an HPV at 12 or a PAP at 6 and 12. Good. And remember that you're on the boards, you do not treat Gardasil patients any differently than non Gardasil. And what's the age range for Gardasil? 
9 to 26. And it has now been approved for um, anal dysplasia and it is not yet, but will be approved for men. And in Europe and Australia, it's already approved for men. So over your course, you have to do high risk HPV in Bangkok? Pardon? This patient, mm -hmm. if you have an ask as pap, mm -hmm. you got three choices. You can do right, copo right away, which is never chosen because you'd be copoing everybody, okay? You can do HPV testing and then copo them if they're high risk. Mm -hmm. Or you can repeat the pap and do copo if the second pap is positive. And really, repeating the pap and doing HPV are, are very, very similar. Okay, 24-year-old woman, has acute abdominal pain, has a huge adnexal mass, and what kind of tumor do you expect her to have, doctors? Germ cell, okay. What if she had been complaining of hirsutism and breast atrophy for about three weeks before this happened? And she had a mustache. Estrogen gives you breast atrophy? Leydig cell tumor. Okay. And what if it was a six-year-old who was complaining about she had a big mass and she has breast development and vaginal bleeding? What tumor makes estrogen? Granulosa cell tumor. Okay. Now the next patient is a six-year-old girl who has no mass and she has vaginal bleeding and breast development. What's the most likely explanation? Six. Foreign body gives you breast development? Breast development and vaginal bleeding in a six-year-old and there's no mass. Does she have precocious puberty with breast development and vaginal bleeding? No. Remember, British Petroleum, General Motors. Breast development, pubarc, growth spurt, and menarch. Okay? So somebody who has breast development and vaginal bleeding has pseudopuberty. So why would a six-year-old girl have pseudopuberty? Most likely explanation is she got into the medicine cabinet and she's taken grandma's Premarin or mom's birth control pills. Okay? Without a mass, it's, it's probably exogenous medication. So this girl, 24-year-old, I'm sorry, has a tumor shown in figure 36 that has very strange-looking glandular kind of things here. And this is known as a Schiller-Duval body, which is indicative of a endermal sinus tumor. If they told you she had call exner bodies, you would say she had a granulosa cell tumor. If she had hobnail or coffee, I'm sorry, coffee bean nuclei, you would say she had a, well, dysterminoma. Yeah, actually you hear the term in both. Okay, and hobnail cells would indicate clear cell which clear cell carcinoma, okay? And somoma bodies would indicate? Papillary serous. okay. All right. And then Rankine's, Rankine's Crystals indicates? Leydig cell. cell for Rankine's, okay. Okay, so this patient has endodermal sinus tumor, and she had a USO and staging. What are you going to do next? Serial AFP, Taxol and Carbo, Cisplatinum, Interperitoneal and Taxol, BEP, or Emico? Someone said BEP. What's that? Treatment for, treatment for germ cell cancers. Okay. So bleomycin causes pulmonary fibrosis. Etoposide causes cancer, and cisplatinum causes the three N's, nausea, nephropathy, and neuropathy, okay? 
No. Which germ cell cancers, I'm glad you asked, which germ cell cancers do not get treated? A stage 1A dysterminoma will be watched. A stage 1A grade 1 immature teratoma will be watched. And Yeah. And there are other exceptions. For example, if someone has an EST with a very low AFP level, that's not, a, that's not board material. But you're going to watch a stage 1A dysterminoma and a stage 1A grade 1 endodermal. I'm sorry, stage 1A dysterminoma and stage 1A grade 1 immature teratoma. This patient's going to get chemo. She's got a big, big tumor. So for the same way how you do it every year is for the year old, 30, oh, I'm sorry, 65 year old had a bunch of surgery for ovarian cancer. She comes back 12 days later. She's tachycardic, has a fever. She has erythema in the incision, tendinous, and spreading erythema beyond the incision. What are you going to do? You started the IV antibiotics. What do you think she has? Necrotizing fasciitis, okay. What are the two most common types of NF? Um, isn't that the one? What's type 1? This, isn't that the one that's um, more polymicrobial? So type 1 is polymicrobial. And what's type 2? Isn't that more the streptococcus? Group A strep. The, and the yep. Can you get the saccharobius from that one? Yeah, but it's group A strep. Which is worse? Which one is always worse? I don't know. Whichever one kills you. All right. A 60-year-old has hypertension, has had a CVA, and has a small early breast cancer that is receptor positive. She's done with her radiation and surgery. What are you going to give her afterwards? Why? So tamoxifen can cause DVT still. Megase can do the same thing. Chemotherapy is not the treatment for receptor positive breast cancer. And this is a serum, and this is the best thing to use. Okay. You can use it, yep. It causes DVTs. When you fail tamoxifen and the aromatase Yeah. Yeah. So it's more like a third line treatment? Yep. Okay, a 46-year-old with menomenorrhagia, so she's premenopausal. She has multiple fibroids with a big one. She gets surgery, and here's the lesion. And these are mitoses. And this is one, 10 high, one high power field. So that's equivalent to just seeing this. This is a mitotic count of at least 40. So what does she have? Lyomyosarcoma, okay? And some of these are looking kind of weird. I'm not qualified to comment, but they don't look monotonous, okay? So she has a tipia and a high mitotic count. So she has a lyomyosarcoma. And a mitotic count of 40 is really really bad okay what are you going to do now have her come back in three months do a bso in nodes pelvic radiation adriamycin or ifosamide okay this is like a grade 26 tumor i mean a mitotic count of 40 the cutoff is 10. This is a mitotic count of like 40. But it's just limited to the uterus, right? The myosarcoma? That's all you know so now. So don't, don't, so don't you don't surveillance? No, no, no. You will either, it, it's either one of the chemotherapy or, 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 or BSO. But the thing is, you will still stage them. They need a complete surgery. Why? Huh? Why, Pavlov? Why do you stage them? Because you <laughs> don't. Oh, you stage them. 
you stay them to see how not them but any surgery you stay them to see how far extended have they gone to decide and what are you going to do about it it gives the prognosis so the prognosis is then would you want to go back for additional surgery with six weeks of recovery so you can get a progno better prognosis okay Okay. Adrian, classically, classically, the way it, it's always worked out is that doxorubicin is for Lyme myosarcoma and ifosamide is for MMT, but now they're they're mixing all that up. That's just the historic. Okay. So why are we surveillance? Because there's not really much to do. If you give her pelvic radiation, what's going to happen? She'll get lung mets. Okay. Now, pelvic radiation is an option because she has a very high mitotic count. She will recur, and you can say, well, the worst place to recur is your pelvis. So we're not going to improve your cure rate, but we're going to improve what's going to happen to you. you. You really would rather have lung mets than pelvic mets. Okay? And keep choice D&E, by the way. You can tell that neither one of those is the answer because they're both drugs that are used. Okay? So really... Do you do a BSO for sarcoma? No. What's the only sarcoma you do a BSO for? Maybe. No. Low-grade stromal sarcoma. Remember, stromal sarcomas are low-grade and high-grade. Low-grade stromal sarcomas may respond to either castration or progestins. Uh-huh. 